Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. As most of you know, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I am so blessed to do the work that I do because I get to facilitate one-on-one angel sessions, which are magical. They're hour-long sessions that take place over the phone, and we engage in heartfelt, soul-inspired conversation. I draw oracle cards for you, and I bring forward messages from the angels for you. And I also offer a longer form of support called soul mentoring. My friend Cecilia calls it angel mentoring, where we meet each week and I track with you, the angels track with you as as you go through a time of growth and healing and transition. And then I offer a wide variety of classes that I hope will inspire you. I usually have a new offering every six weeks or so The best way to stay informed is to go over to my website, illuminatingsouls.com, and sign up for my mailing list. You'll have two options on the home page. The first is at the top of the page, where you can sign up for my announcement list and my newsletter list. And then further down below, you can choose into my daily inspiration email blast and you will receive an inspiring email from me every weekday. In addition to that, I have a wonderful oracle deck called the Earth Angels Oracle, which is now available. It's a beautiful way to bring the angels home with you, and I will have a link in the show notes if you want to learn more. So lots of ways we can connect, but for now... The angels and I are here to co-create a sweet oasis of love for you. I originally designed this podcast as a sleep podcast, which is why it has the word sleepy and bedtime in the title. And this is because I am an avid listener of sleep podcasts. I listen to one every night as I'm going to sleep. Last night, I queued up an episode of the sleepy bookshelf and I went back into their archive to listen to one of the episodes where the host Elizabeth is reading Little Women which I have come to love so much that book and so that helped me drift off to sleep last night so if you are using this as a sleep tool my recommendation is you listen to it at a lower volume than you would if you were listening to an audiobook where you really want to pay attention. If you turn the volume down a little bit lower, you have to reach for it a little bit, which actually makes drifting off to sleep easier. And each episode is an hour long, not because I have an expectation that you will stay riveted the whole hour. Rather, it is because that is my preference as a listener. There are sleep podcasts out there, but they're only 20 or 30 minutes long, and that gives me a sense of anxiety to think I have to be asleep in 20 minutes because it feels so sad to me if I listen to something to put me to sleep and I'm not asleep by the end of it. So my hope is an hour is going to be long enough for you. If if you need more time, you can actually set up a playlist in your favorite podcast app and keep this playing all night if you'd like to. And then I also want to say hello to those of you who listen during your waking hours because you're finding that this broadcast is a good companion to your day. So however you are listening, 
I am deeply grateful to have this time with you. So as I record this, it is the middle of October 2023, and there is a lot happening in the world right now, which I am not going to talk about because it is a sleep podcast. And I want you to be in a place of coziness and soothing, calming energies. But what I do want to share and reflect upon is when things are chaotic and challenging, something like this sleep podcast or other tools can really support us in helping to regulate our nervous system. I know that that is something I've been paying attention to the past two weeks. Yesterday, I wound up going for a lovely walk around our neighborhood. It wasn't the kind of brisk walk where I was focusing on my steps or getting my heart rate up. It was just a sweet walk around my neighborhood. I was looking at the Halloween decorations that neighbors had put up and I was listening to an audiobook, Walking in Wonder, I think is the title, by John O'Donohue. And, and listen, I would have pronounced his name John O'Donohue, but in the book, they say it's John O'Donohue in the audiobook. So that's why I am pronouncing it that way, even though it feels clumsy on my tongue. And one of the things that is reflected upon is that each of us lives in two worlds. And, and listen, I'm going to paraphrase this very badly. I'm terrible at paraphrasing what I've read. But in essence, we have the outer world that we're participating in. And then we have our inner world. And that it is our job to tend to our inner world because we're really the only ones who can. And I've really been thinking about that in relationship to everything that's been happening when difficulty arrives when something happens that can profoundly change the landscape of either our personal experience or our collective experience. It takes time to renegotiate and and reacclimate to our building blocks of consciousness because of everything that might have been stirred up as a result. And I feel like yesterday was almost the first day that I feel like my consciousness had an opportunity to breathe. And it's not that everything that's transpiring isn't affecting me anymore. It absolutely is. But it's almost like a muscle that has to have an opportunity to change form so that it can serve us better. Like getting your sea legs would be a good example of that. That I haven't spent much time on boats, but I do remember my one and only cruise that Wes and I took. At first it feels strange, and then I got used to it. It's like our equilibrium shifts to accommodate the new present everyday reality that we're in. And so I've been seeking different forms of care, self-care to help me re-regulate, self-regulate. And so I share that with you in case that's helpful information. So I went for a walk again. It's not even worth telling you about. I'm not telling you this to signal my virtue that I walked or it's just a reminder that sometimes simple interventions can help soothe and calm our nervous systems and discharge the excess so that we can find our balance, and then be a part of the world again. Because 
being part of the world is what we're here for. And so I want to acknowledge you, my beautiful friend. I don't know where you are in your own experience of life right now. But I want to acknowledge you for showing up. However you're showing up right now, even if showing up for you right now is not showing up. To please take good care of yourself. Because in taking good care of yourself, it will more easily make it possible for you to then show up for the parts of life that are important to you. Whether it's showing up as an advocate, whether that's showing up as a healer, or a parent, or an aunt, or an uncle, or somebody who checks people out at the grocery store. I, I was at the grocery store the other day and the woman who was helping me at the deli counter was so kind. She had this beautiful smile on her face and she was nice and I thought, you know, we're all in this cosmic soup of awfulness right now in the world and I don't know, I just thought, wow, she got up this morning and she came into this job where she has to deal with all different kinds of people and she was able to greet me with a smile. And I don't know, the fullness of that moment just was very present for me. So I want to acknowledge you for all the ways you show up. And if you're feeling tender right now, if you're feeling off kilter, it's understandable. And so please engage in forms of self-care that will help you find your way. And if this podcast is helping, I'm honored because there's a lot to assimilate right now. There's a lot to bear witness to. It's important that we plug in and it's also important that we take that breath as we need to so that we can find our way back to center and to self so that we can be of service. So my beautiful, darling, precious friend, I am so profoundly grateful for the gift of you. And I'm so grateful to bring the angels in to share with you. And they're already here. I hope you can feel the love with which this broadcast is coming to you. And I love sharing the ritual of bringing the angels in. So I invite you to close your eyes and take a nice deep breath in and out. As we gently call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And I ask that you bring forward precious waves of light, of healing, of love, of peace, compassion, and goodness. And angels, I ask that you bring special blessings of light to each of our beloveds listening to this message and rippling these prayers all around the world where they are so profoundly needed right now. Please cocoon us in light that we may feel deeply the love and support that God and the angels bring to us now. And dear ones, just take a nice deep breath in. I am feeling so much love flowing in. In this moment, I especially feel the love of Divine Mother. I feel the beauty of her heart and she is sharing her heart energy with you. I am seeing this in my mind's eye as a soft pink light. 
very much the color of rose quartz. And she is sharing her heart energy with you because she acknowledges that it is easy to feel depleted right now. So just breathe and let your breath center in your heart chakra and receive, receive the love Divine Mother is sharing with you. You are so very precious to her. And she asks that you allow her to assist you in receiving these soothing and calming, comforting energies. And just breathe, just breathe. She knows the truth of your heart. She acknowledges all that you are feeling and experiencing. And she is bringing you light. So if you will, take some nice deep breaths in and out, allowing yourself to be surrounded and filled with this beautiful divine love that has been calibrated just for you. And while you receive this love, this love is also being transmitted around the world. It is going to all that you love. It is going to the collective. It is going to the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the mineral kingdom. It is being broadcast through all time and space. The angels want to remind you that you have permission to rest, to go off duty, to lift your feet up off the planet so that you can replenish and restore. So just breathe, my beautiful darling friend, and allow yourself to be, to just be you in this moment. There are blessings flowing your way. There are treasures still to be found by you and for you. Thank you for being one who feels such deep love. You are very precious in this world. And we are so deeply grateful for the gift of you. So my sweet friend, you rest. And while you rest, the angels and Divine Mother and the light of God will watch over you and take good care of you. And while you rest, I'm going to tell you a story or two story time. So you cozy on up and snuggle on in. And we're going to ramble our way through some stories together. So I really wanted story time for this episode to be something that would be lighthearted and fun So two episodes ago, we talked about pumpkin spice. I was going to record this episode so that it dropped on Wednesday, but honestly, I was so tired from the week that I just put up a replay of Ninja Creamy, the Ninja Creamy episode, which is a really fun story if you haven't heard it. And the Ninja Creamy episode was actually... along the lines of what we're going to be talking about in this episode, which is ice cream. 
Because I don't know about you, but ice cream to me is a happy food. I don't eat it anymore because I don't eat sugar. But I am somebody deeply imprinted with food. And so I have a lifetime of memories of ice cream that bring me joy. It's interesting. I had mentioned in the first part of the episode how I was listening to the John O'Donohue audiobook Walking in Wonder and there's a section where he's talking about memory and that all too often we use our memory to re-experience bad stuff but that we can also use our memory to experience joy and so I don't know that's what we're gonna do we're gonna kind of go down memory lane we're gonna talk about ice cream I don't know. It just vibrationally makes me very happy and perhaps it will help lighten things up for you a little bit too. So growing up, we always had ice cream in our house. Back then, um, ice cream would come in the gallon containers, yes. And it would always kind of have, um, I don't know how many of you remember the movie Mother by Albert Brooks, and it's with Debbie Reynolds. It is a funny, brilliant movie, if you haven't seen it. And Debbie Reynolds plays Albert Brooks's character's mother, and she takes this gallon container of, I think it was sherbet, out of the freezer. And <laughs> Albert Brooks is horrified because as she takes the lid off, there's all this ice there's these ice crystals on top and and she digs underneath it and he goes what is wrong with that and she goes oh that's the protective coating <laughs> and so my memory of ice cream in our house because you know back in the 60s and the 70s the refrigeration appliances were not as well calibrated as they are today so it was not uncommon for the ice cream in our house to have that icy crystallized quote protective coating on it so there'd be a lot of digging involved to get to the ice cream and my mom always liked a little dish of ice cream it always had to be a little dish because she was always on a diet so in my house, you would never just take the whole gallon to the couch and eat out of it. You'd have a little dish, a little glass dish of ice cream. But ice cream was also a treat food, especially in the summer. So of course, I was indoctrinated into the world of 31 flavors, Baskin Robbins, which played a big part in my childhood, as well as Good Humor Ice Cream and the Good Humor Man. Now, I don't know if both of these brands are international. I think 31 Flavors is or Baskin Robbins is. That is our big chain ice cream store. And especially that was the case in childhood. So Baskin Robbins colors were always, I think, brown and pink. And I thought what I would start off with is reading the Wikipedia article that talks about Baskin Robbins. And then I will in, infuse my own Baskin Robbins memories. And then we'll do the same with good humor. So we'll start with Baskin Robbins though. So Baskin Robbins is an American multinational chain of ice cream and cake specialty shops owned by Inspire Brands. Baskin Robbins was founded in 1945 by Bert Baskin and Irv Robbins in Glendale, California. Its headquarters are in Canton, Massachusetts, and it is shared now with its sibling brand of Dunkin' Donuts, but that's a relatively modern development, but that was not the case in my childhood. The company is known for its 31 Flavors slogan, with an idea that a customer could have a different flavor every day of the month. So let's get to the history, because I think that's the interesting part. Baskin Robbins was founded in 1945, so it repeats that piece of information by Baskin and Robbins from the merging of their respective ice cream parlors in Glendale, California. 
Bert Baskin learned about ice cream while he was in the military during World War II and opened Burton's Ice Cream Shop in California in 1946. Irv Robbins managed an ice cream counter in his father's store as a teenager and in 1945 used $6,000 to open Snowbird Ice Cream in California. In 1948, they decided to combine their companies and call it Baskin Robbins. Snowbird ice cream offered 21 flavors, and when they merged, the number of flavors was expanded to 31. And so they opened a bunch more stores. I'm going to kind of skip over this because I really want to talk about ice cream, not business. So let's see if I can get to more of the ice cream information. And I can confirm that Baskin Robbins is indeed international. It has more than 8,000 shop locations all over the world. And rather than go into the business side of things, let's talk about ice cream, right? Because that's what we're all here for. That's what I'm here for. So, they are famous for letting people taste the different flavors of ice cream with a small single-use pink plastic spoon which was a huge part of childhood. Even if you'd had the ice cream a thousand times, you'd still ask for a sample, and they came in those little baby pink spoons. So, the original flavors when Baskin Robbins first opened in 1945 were as follows. Banana nut fudge. And I may give my editorial on some of these flavors, so you can do the same in your own consciousness. I personally have, I love banana bread and I love bananas, but I do not like banana flavored ice cream. I don't know why. I just don't think it should be there. Weird thing. But they also had black walnut, which I don't know that I've ever had. Burgundy cherry, which I do remember because it had the, those I don't know if they were maraschino cherries or those big black cherries in them, and I was a big cherry fiend as a kid. Butterscotch ribbon. Now, I personally feel like butterscotch is not given its due. It has been surpassed by caramel, and caramel and butterscotch are not the same thing. I have always loved butterscotch. So I do remember loving butterscotch ribbon as a kid. Cherry macaron. I don't know that one. Of course, chocolate. But okay, we'll talk about the simplicity of chocolate in a moment. First, I'll get through the flavors. Then there's chocolate almond, chocolate chip, of course, brilliant, chocolate fudge, chocolate mint, which is a brilliant invention chocolate ribbon. So here's my little aside. It's interesting. What kind of personality would just pick plain chocolate over chocolate and something else? See, for me, I always want more of something. So just plain chocolate ice cream. It's not that it's a bad thing. If it's the only thing that existed, it'd be amazing. But I would get, you know, chocolate with something. I I would want more. So out of this list, I would probably go between chocolate chip, which was always a good choice, or chocolate mint. But they don't yet have the one that I always went for as a kid, which I will talk about if it's not in the list. So bear with me. I'll build a little suspense into this whole thing, because why not? Then there's coffee. Now, my mom loved the Jamocha almond fudge. She loved coffee ice cream. And so I learned to love coffee ice cream as well. I don't know that I would have ever picked it as my only flavor, but I would always get to have a spoonful of my mom's. So that worked for me. And then something called coffee candy, which may reflect upon my conversation on chocolate with something else. So If there's coffee versus coffee candy, I would have probably wanted the one with the candy involved. Date nut. I don't know what that was. Doesn't sound good to me, though. Eggnog. Now, 
eggnog, I think, can be a very um, controversial flavor because you either love it or not. And I don't know if it's because I grew up Jewish and I never had it as a kid. It was never a flavor profile that I was introduced to in my childhood. So I am not an eggnog flavor person. But I would imagine if you grew up with eggnog, that this ice cream would sound fantastic to you. Then there's French vanilla, which I think is a far superior product to regular vanilla. Green mint stick. I don't know what that is, but I would imagine there's candy involved. Lemon crisp, lemon custard, and lemon sherbet. Again, controversial opinion. It's not that I don't like lemon desserts. I love a good lemon poppy seed muffin. Again, this is when I was eating sugar. I need to clarify that. But I would have never gone into an ice cream store and asked for lemon anything. But perhaps you would. Now we've got maple nut, so maple. I talked about this in the Trader Joe's segment of the pumpkin spice episode. I love maple flavored stuff. I don't know that I would have picked it as a kid, though. Orange sherbet. I had to take a big breath on that because to me, sherbet was always the consolation prize when my mother wouldn't give us ice cream. I think in the 60s, there was this perception that sherbet was healthier than ice cream. I don't know why. So for me, there was always a disappointment when sherbet was involved because what I really wanted was ice cream. So I would have never gone and picked sherbet from 31 Flavors. There's peach. I'm sure that would have delighted somebody. Peppermint fudge ribbon, which sounds amazing. I love peppermint and chocolate together. Peppermint stick, which again, delightful. We're back in the sherbet rounds. We've got pineapple sherbet and raspberry sherbet. Always pretty colors, but I would have never picked those. Rocky Road Nut sounds great. Strawberry, always have to have that, although I'm not a fan. I mean, it's good, but I would never pick it. Vanilla and vanilla burnt almond, which sounds amazing. And now we're going to reflect upon their current flavors. Oh, I think one of my favorites is on here. Okay, hold on. These are the Baskin and Robbins current flavors, at least here in the U.S. I don't know what they are internationally. Of course, mint chocolate chip, a classic. Always like a palate cleanser, right? It's bright. It's a bright flavor. Love Potion number 31. I have no idea what that is. It has probably been a good 10 years since I have been in a Baskin Robbins, so I apologize for not being able to give you any sort of on-the-ground reporting about these flavors. I should probably just go look it up. Hold on, I'll be right back. Okay, Google, it's a thing. Here we go. Love Potion number 31. You may already know about this ice cream. This is from the Baskin Robbins website. We'll put a spell on you with white chocolate and raspberry flavored ice creams. Finished off with raspberry swirls, chocolate flavored chips, and raspberry filled chocolate flavored hearts. It's a classic, but not so much a classic as it existed in my childhood. It sounds good, although again, wouldn't be my flavor profile. All right, back to the list. They've got chocolate, Oreo cookies and cream, a great collaboration, chocolate chip, a must have, pralines and cream. I'm a huge pralines and cream fan, as well as butter pecan, which I have not seen on this list yet. Very berry strawberry, chocolate chip cookie dough. You know, the whole invention of cookie dough as 
something that can be consumed without having to actually make cookies was freaking genius. I mean, we all were eating the cookie dough anyways, but the fact that it became its own commodity that did not have to be actually baked and then it got put in things, thank you Ben and Jerry's, which is a fascinating story on how Ben and Jerry's got created. I read their book on how they started Ben and Jerry's. And as I recall, I don't remember if it was Ben or Jerry. They had a hard time always tasting things. So they wanted to put big chunks of whatever was in their, their ice cream. They wanted to make it really big and flavorful. And so I don't know if they were the first ones to put cookie dough in ice cream, but I seem to remember they had, they were a big influencer when it came to that. Oh, old fashioned butter pecan is here. I loved that one. Again, back to this whole idea of butterscotch, butter pecan, a flavor profile I have always enjoyed. Jamocha. Jamocha, I think, is their coffee ice cream because I remember Jamocha almond fudge. Peanut butter cup. Again, brilliant. Bringing peanut butter and chocolate into the world together. Rocky Road. You would think I would be a Rocky Road fan. Not so much. Marshmallows are fine, but marshmallows, as much as I love sugar, marshmallows are not necessarily a passion food for me. I can take them or leave them. Peanut butter and chocolate. That was my favorite. Was that the one that had the big ribbon of peanut butter going through the chocolate ice cream? Because if so, that was my absolute favorite. But actually, they haven't come across my childhood favorite, which I, I'm just going to tell you about because I don't know that they even make it anymore. As a kid, it was gumball ice cream. So you get a scoop of this, I seem to remember it was pink or blue, some child friendly color, and it would have gumballs in it. So again, I want a lot of something and I want a variety. So when we would go to Baskin Robbins, I would go for the gumball ice cream because I could eat the ice cream and save my gumballs. And I would have two treats instead of one. I've always been about the buffet option of life. So gumball ice cream was one of my favorite Baskin Robbins flavors as a kid. Okay, gold medal ribbon, which I think has caramel and chocolate running through it. I don't remember. World-class chocolate. I don't know how that's different from chocolate. I mean, if you're going to go for chocolate ice cream, do you want just chocolate or do you want world-class chocolate? I don't know what the difference is. Cherry's Jubilee. I'm sure that's delightful. Chocolate fudge. Daiquiri ice. Now, I know that is a very popular flavor. Never came to love it. Again, rainbow sherbet, rainbow chocolate fudge cake, wild and reckless. And you knew that that one was worthy of looking up, right? First of all, it looks absolutely beautiful. It is a sherbet, but it looks like it has a bunch of different colors in it. It looks like it has blue and pink and green. So it says you're invited to a party. Well, let's go. A green... <laughs> Okay, sorry, because this sounds terrible to me. No offense, Baskin Robbins. I've already established I'm not a Sherbert person, so I'm sure this is amazing to people. Green apple, blue raspberry, and fruit punch all mixed together as Sherbert in a tie-dye ice cream. I'm sure this makes people very, very happy, but it would not be my thing. And you know what? I'm on Baskin and Robbins' website, and I am happy to report to you that even though I do not see this on the list, but I have not gone through the whole list. Oh, because it's a regional flavor. We have still a long way to go through my Baskin Robbins list, but I had to skip ahead because they do have pink bubblegum ice cream. That's what I would have gotten for sure. I'm looking at these pictures and I'm going through which ice creams I would have gotten. Oh, I see world-class chocolate. It looks like it's a blend of 
white chocolate and reg and chocolate chocolate. Okay, all right, I understand now. Still want to pick that one. The picture on the peanut butter and chocolate though looks amazing with those huge threads of the peanut butter running through the chocolate. Yummo. Okay, well good. I am now totally jonesing for chocolate. But I don't eat sugar, so I'm just going to vicariously enjoy it through Google. But let's keep going on our list, shall we? Because we have way more to get through. Strawberry cheesecake and something called Pokey Dot. Don't know what that is. Not inclined to look it up. There's seasonal flavors, including America's Birthday Cake. Baseball nut, blueberry cheesecake, bourbon street pecan pie, brownie bar mashup. These all sound really good, don't they? There's a whole bunch more. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just very happy to say that there is pink bubble gum. And then there's the, I don't know what the difference is between an ice and a sorbet, but they have grape ice watermelon ice, and then things like the sherbets and sorbet, Miami Vice sorbet. So I'm not sure of the difference between sherbet, ice, and sorbet. I'm not inclined to look it up because I don't care that much <laughs> because neither ices, sorbets, or sherbets are my thing. If I'm going to go for the sugar and the calories, I am totally getting a high fat ice cream for sure. And then they do have reduced fat, no sugar added ice cream, which I haven't, I, th I think I've had it a couple times, but I would not go to Baskin Robbins just for that. But they have butter almond crunch that is no sugar. Never mind. I'm not even going to read them to you because I just don't care. I can't get worked up about those. So a couple of Baskin Robbins related memories. There was a Baskin and Robbins about a mile from our house up on Tui. We live down near Howard in Skokie. You don't know where those streets are, but I just mention it because it's part of my memory. And as kids, we were allowed to walk up to Baskin Robbins, which was a big deal because it was kind of far. But this was the 60s and we could do those things. And we would go and we would eat ice cream. And it was a big deal that we got to go out and get ice cream. And when my family went, my mother usually would get butter pecan, pralines and cream, or coffee. My brother would almost always get mint chocolate chip. My sister would oddly get vanilla. I don't know. She, she was a vanilla kind of girl. But again, I think it's because, she, I don't know, as a kid, she was a very picky eater. And now I think vanilla is actually a legitimate flavor, but I didn't think that as a kid. And I have already established I would typically go for the bubble gum because the twofer. Buy one, get one. I also loved the mint chocolate chip and the chocolate chip. Again, with the chocolate chip, it felt like I was getting an extra something with my ice cream. It wasn't just ice cream. It had chips in it. So I was really big on ice cream and something else with my ice cream. So you would think when Ben and Jerry's came out with their big chunky ice creams, it would have been a field day for me. But by that point, I was always on a perpetual diet and trying not to eat too much sugar. So I actually have never been a big Ben and Jerry's consumer Nora Hagen does, consumer, that as an adult, I really segued into those low-fat, no-sugar, dryers, briars, <laughs> ice creams. But also, if we're going to be talking about my childhood, I want to segue over to good humor, because the good humor man, and forgive me just being very gender-specific, but in the 60s, it was always a man. There may have been good humor women, but I was not aware of them, and so we referred to them as good humor men. Again, I don't know if good humor is international, but I would imagine that in most places in the world, there was some kind of vehicle that would come down the street and sell ice cream, 
right? The ice cream truck. So, so there were the trucks that would do sort of the pulled ice cream, you know, like the frozen custard kind of ice cream, but good humor was its own brand. And they had these white trucks and the drivers would be dressed in these white uniforms with a hat. And they had those change makers that they wore on their belts. They were these magical things where the quarters and the dimes and the pennies and the nickels all lived in different cylinders. And they would hit the little button and like a penny would come out or a dime would come out. It was very groovy. And there would always be a picture menu on the front panel uh, or the side panel, not the front panel, the side panel of the truck. And you would pick what you wanted. And then the good humor man would open up this freezer door and reach his hand into some mysterious cavern of ice cream goodness and pull out whatever it is that you had asked for. So let's read a little bit just about the history of good humor. It started in Youngstown, Ohio during the early 1920s and covered most of the country by the mid-1930s. In 1961, good humor was acquired by Thomas J. Lipton, the U.S. subsidiary of the International Unilever Conglomerate. Interesting. So by the time I was a kid, it was already a corporate entity. So in the 1920s, in 1919 to be specific, Christian Nelson, an Iowa store owner, discovered how to coat an ice cream bar with chocolate, inventing the Eskimo pie. So can we all just please acknowledge the brilliance of Christian Nelson to bring us Eskimo pies and chocolate covered ice cream bars. So when he heard of the discovery, Harry Burt, owner of a Youngstown, Ohio ice cream parlor, replicated Nelson's product. So, so the Eskimo pie, for those of you who are who are not familiar with it is kind of, um, it doesn't have a stick. So it's just a chocolate covered slab of ice cream that you would eat with a wrapper. So what they say here, very interesting. The story is that Bert's 23 year old daughter, Ruth thought that the new novelty item was too messy. So Bert's son, Harry Jr. suggested using a wooden stick as a convenient handle. I love how they weave both his son and daughter into this story. Who knows if it's true, but it makes a good corporate story, right? They tried out the idea in the store's hardening room, where they discovered that the stick formed a strong bond when the ice cream crystallized. Bert outfitted 12 street vending trucks in Youngstown with rudimentary freezers and bells to sell his good humor ice cream suckers. Well, there you go. And good humor was born. And then there's just a lot of corporate information, which I'm not as interested in. Yeah. And, you know, and then I don't know, it just sort of, it, it, it just sort of kind of became something that you bought in the store rather than from the street. So, so let me just talk to you about though, what good humor was like as a kid, because We lived for that moment when we heard the bells. There were these bells that would chime. And we'd all scream, Good humor, man's here. (laughs) And it seemed to recall at that time, the bars were like 10 cents and 15 cents. So we'd get a bunch of change from our parents. And I remember my dad loved the toasted almond or the coconut. My mom would sometimes get the coconut Somebody got the strawberry shortcake. Then there was the chocolate eclair, which had the candy bar in the middle. Again, twofer. What do you think my favorite one was? Chocolate eclair, of course. There was sort of like this nutty candy outside. Then there was ice cream. And then there was a chocolate center. Like, no brainer. Why would you not get the chocolate eclair out of all the choices you had? And my parents would always give me a bite of theirs because they were really good parents. 
I just think about that these days. You know, I see the size of a candy bar, and I don't know that they were that much bigger back then, even with shrinkage these days. Even take a big-sized ice cream bar. When you have kids taking bites of your ice cream bar, that ice cream bar is going to become significantly smaller. So I always just get the loveliest, warm-hearted feeling when I think of how generously my parents allowed me to take a bite of their ice cream bars. I think they were such good people. I know it sounds weird to, to just wax so poetic about that, but to me it's just symbolic of how generous my parents were always, always, no matter what. I can only imagine, you know, and maybe it's because I don't have my own children and I never went through that precious child phase with with little ones that, you know, I had that nurturing relationship with. But if I had my ice cream bar and somebody wanted to bite, I'd be like, oh, okay, but a little one. <laughs> maybe I could just get you your own ice cream bar. Although if Wes wanted a bite of my ice cream bar, I would let him. And I would let you too. So maybe it's not that great of a of a um, act of generosity, but as I look back on it, I just think it's so sweet because my parents always let me taste whatever they had, which I suppose good parents do, so high five mom and dad. Thank you for your generous spirit. So yeah, good humor was such a joyful thing. And then of course there was Dairy Queen, but I don't remember having a big relationship with Dairy Queen. There may have been one in our area. We did sometimes get milkshakes, which are sort of an ice cream adjacent product from Burger King. So once a month or so, my parents would go to Burger King because I don't think McDonald's was that big then. My dad would get the fish sandwich. My mother would get a Whopper. At some point, there would be a milkshake involved. I don't remember what his kids got. Probably just a hamburger and fries. Who knows? But that we got to sip on somebody's milkshake was a big deal, too, you know, that they shared. And then I'll also just add that, as I've already shared with you, pretty much in my adult decades, we'll say, you know, 20s through 50s, I would consume the most diet-friendly version of ice cream that I could. (laughs) So, non-fat, sugar-free, whipped up so it's less calories. And for many years, I would almost always have ice cream in my freezer. And I would never consume the whole carton, so I know sometimes people do that. I was always way too conscious of my addictive habits. And so I would sometimes eat spoonfuls out of the carton, but I would be very cautious that I never went below a certain line that I had established for myself as enough, that arbitrary enough line. Sometimes I would have it in a dish. And then, of course, over the years, you no longer bought a gallon or a half gallon or even a quart. Everything has shrunk a lot. And definitely an honorary mention to a local candy store here called Lily's in Vallejo. Now, since I've gone off sugar, they have had a change in ownership. And I have not had their ice cream since that time. I've heard it's still really, really good. But years ago, when I was eating sugar, I can attest that they made all their own ice cream. And it was good ice cream. (laughs) It was so good. And Wes and I loved their ice cream. Although we didn't like the same flavor. Wes loved their blueberry cheesecake or their raspberry cheesecake. He liked the whole, he 
you know, chunks of cheesecake and graham cracker and the ribbon of either blueberry or raspberry, that would be his flavor. I loved, they had a chocolate Grand Marnier, so it had that orange liqueur and chocolate flavor, and it was a deep, rich chocolate, delicious. And then I can't remember, I don't think it was pralines and cream, I think it was butter pecan. It was one of those, but it had this butterscotch ribbon and pecans and deliciousness. And Wes is allergic to walnuts and pecans, so I have to be very careful not to mix that stuff in with stuff that he will ultimately eat. So usually we would either each get our scoops, which is delightful, or we would each get our own quartz and we would go to town. <laughs> they would last us a few days. But it was really good ice cream, and I'm of the philosophy that if you are going to indulge in something that has, you know, a high caloric sugar content, it should be the best. Like, I'm not going to lose it just over store-bought ice cream. It's like how I've shared with you before, I'm not going to just go to Trader Joe's for a croissant. I'm going to go to a bakery if I'm going to have a croissant. And I feel the same way about really good ice cream. So, honorary mention to Lily's. Again, I'm sure their ice cream is good these days, but they had a change of ownership when I went off of sugar in 2019, and I haven't been in there since. But they're supposed to still be really good. But they were our ice cream of choice for many years before I went off of sugar. And if you ever went to my parents' house, you would have always found ice cream in the freezer. And my mom always loved to have a little dish of ice cream as dessert. And she'd always say that, I'm gonna have a little dish of ice cream. It always had to be qualified with the little. I'm gonna have a little dish of ice cream. <laughs> there was no just like scooping it out of the container and eating it by the spoonful. It went into a little glass dish. And we always had the ice cream scoops, you know, where you flicked the, the scoop out of the, the holder. And so it was gold, I remember, I think. And, you know, you'd scoop out your little scoop of ice cream. And it's sweet because with Wes and I, we just went for it with a spoon. We just would bring, eat it out of the spoon. Every once in a while, I would introduce an ice cream cone into the thing because sometimes it's lovely to have a cone as your holder that the ice cream goes into, but typically I was just going at it with a spoon. These days I don't eat ice cream, although I do have a Ninja Creamy, which I share about in the episode I just uploaded as the replay, the one before this one. It's interesting, I was crazy about the Ninja Creamy last year. I kept making all kinds of different concoctions for Wes and I. And this summer, I just haven't been into it. I feel like we haven't even had summer. It feels like it hasn't been really hot. I haven't been thinking about ice cream, which is fine. I have one container in the freezer ready to be whipped up in the Ninja Creamy. I seem to recall I made it with my chocolate Shakeology. Shakeology is the protein powder that I use every morning because I love it. And um, I have a Shakeology concoction being on the standby if I want to whip it up in the Ninja Creamy. Just the other day in the midst of the craziness of the world, I was saying to Wes, I just wanted to eat everything because I think sometimes, you know, when things are stressful, I think either you're somebody that can't eat or you're someone that wants to eat everything. And I definitely fall into the eat everything camp, but I also have to be really mindful that, you know, I have a tiny stomach now that I've had bariatric surgery and I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I don't want to. Anyways, you know, I don't want to go to town on foods that are not good for me. 
And I was saying to Wes, I just want to eat everything. And he says, why don't you whip up your Ninja Creamy? Which was a great suggestion, but I didn't want it. I was like, no, that's not what I want. You know, it's, um, never mind. I was going to go down it. Well, I'll tell you anyways. Do you ever have like these inner conversations? Like, okay, if a meteor is coming and going to hit the planet, what would I do? You know, you watch these huge, you know, catastrophic movies and it's like, you have 48 hours before the big meteor is coming. You know, what would you do? And, you know, everyone has a different response. You know what mine is? Okay, I'm freaking going to Costco and I'm getting that giant two layer chocolate fudge cake and a ton of ice cream. And I'm going face first into chocolate cake with ice cream. If you're telling me the whole planet's got 48 hours left, I'm eating my way into the light. (laughs) I hope that doesn't sound dark. I really don't mean it that way. But I was thinking about my love for cake and ice cream and, you know, for sure, I miss those foods. But I don't miss how I felt in my body as a result of eating them. So I'm so glad that I don't necessarily crave them in the way I once did. And if I now have you craving ice cream, I'm so sorry. Don't get sherbet as a substitute for really good ice cream, no. Get really good ice cream. Or get a Ninja Creamy and then you can make your own concoctions of things that will delight you. Because it is possible with the brilliant, miraculous appliance that is the Ninja Creamy. I think in some ways my ice cream desire is sated because every single morning I make a smoothie with chocolate shakeology, which is a pro- like a protein drink. And, and listen, if you look it up, it's incredibly expensive and it's through Beachbody and it's a whole thing. And I hate their business model. I really do. I I'm not telling you to go buy it. I just happen to love it. And a friend of mine helped create it. So I knew him and I knew his integrity. And that's why I tried it. And now I have it all the time. Every single morning, that is my breakfast. I take some cashew milk. And I take some of my chocolate shakeology. I use the vegan one because that's my preference. Even though I'm not a vegan, I just like that one better. And I put in some spinach, a whole bunch of spinach, a couple frozen pieces of banana. So I break my own banana rule about banana doesn't belong in ice cream, but it does belong in smoothies and a bunch of ice. And I put it into my Vitamix. We have a Vitamix that I have used every single morning, completely worth the investment. And now I put a little bit of cold brew concentrate because I'm back on caffeine, which is a whole other story. And I blend it up and it's big and it's thick and it fills me up and it's chocolate and creamy. And I think that sates that part of me that would want ice cream because I have this uber delicious chocolatey creamy milkshake every morning for my breakfast. So perhaps that's why it doesn't torment me (laughs) the way it might otherwise. So I hope you have enjoyed our ice cream ramblings in this episode. You know, we didn't even talk about things like I briefly mentioned Ben and Jerry's. We didn't talk about Haagen-Dazs. We have not talked about the whole frozen yogurt amazement where we also were profoundly duped into it being something healthy, which of course it wasn't, if you remember that fantastic Seinfeld episode. That was a big one for frozen yogurt. Oh, and they give you those sample cups. So, so again, there could be a part two to this at some point. But for now, I wish you the sweetest of dreams, and maybe they really will be sweet because you will dream of ice cream. And I wish you love. And I wish you blessings. And I am so grateful for our time together. We'll talk again soon, my beautiful friend. I love you. And I'm grateful for you.
Thanks.